Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. I call the Space Court Foundation to order. Welcome. My name is Nathan Johnson, and I am co-founder and executive director. Thank you for joining us today for our 2021 intern orientation. The Space Court Foundation is a 501c3 educational nonprofit promoting space law and policy education in the rule of law. The Space Court Foundation produces educational materials and scholarship through the administration of several major projects, all of which are open to our interns, including our research program under the Space Court Law Library, as well as our video series and interview series, which are available alongside programs like the Space Bar Show and Stellar Decisis on our YouTube channel. The foundation also engages in partnerships and collaborations that help grow greater awareness of space law and how disputes in space may be resolved as humans venture further from the earth in the not too distant future. For more information about our mission and programming, after this video, please visit our website at, space, at spacecourtfoundation.org. We also wish to thank the Open Lunar Foundation for sponsoring our webinars for all of 2021. For more information about the Open Lunar Foundation, please visit their website at openlunar.org. We greatly appreciate the strong support of the space community and invite you to follow us on social media if you don't already for the latest information. You can find archive versions of all of our programs on our YouTube channel, including our first 2020 intern orientation at youtube.com forward slash Space Court Foundation. If you enjoy our programming, please remember to like and subscribe. Your continued support helps us to keep providing you contemporary and innovative programming. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash FDN and purchase Space Court Foundation merchandise at celestialobjectionsapparel.com. All proceeds go to the foundation to cover the cost of our programming and support our intern projects. Now for today's program. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Julia Millette, Internship Coordinator for the Space Corps Foundation. She is a practicing attorney who has worked in the FCC Satellite Division and participated in the FCC's orbital debris mitigation rulemaking. She has also worked with the Satellite Industry Association and as a consultant with LMI Advisors. And while in law school, she was a finalist in the North American rounds of the IISL Manfred Lack Space Law Moot Court Competition. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening um, to everyone who's watching, wherever you are in space and time. I hope that you are doing well. Um, really quick note on the work with the FCC. Um, I, I worked there as an intern in law school, so I was really lucky to be there at the exact time they were working on their um, update to their orbital debris mitigation rules. Um, Okay, so yes, I am the internship coordinator at um, the Space Court Foundation, and I'm really happy to be here with you all today um, for our second um, intern orientation. Um, this is a new program. It's been functioning for a little over a year, and we've had um, the most wonderful group of interns from around the world um, participating with our program so far. So I want to encourage those of you who are not yet interns or who are just watching for information um, to head over to our website. Many of our interns' bios and headshots are listed on our website. Um, we have a really great group of talented people um, from around the world who are working with us on our programs. So I just want to give a shout out to our current interns who have done um, really great work so far um, and want to um, welcome all of those of you who are considering being an intern and hope that this will be um, an informative program for you today. Um, so with that, I am going to um, share my screen and talk a little bit about um, the program. The main thing I'm going to be going over um, today is uh, the, some new changes that we are making um, to the program in our second year. Um, sorry, I have to go back to the beginning. Okay. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about um, just the application process for those of you who have not yet applied. Um, so getting right into it, the application process is pretty straightforward. Um, 
our applications on our website. It's a Google form um, and I'll get a notification when someone fills that out. Um, however, in addition to that application form, um, you need to also send your CV or resume, uh, a writing sample, and then a letter of recommendation from a professor or professional colleague to internship.application at gmail.com. Um, the writing sample does not need to be uh, related to space law. Many of our interns, this is their first time engaging in space law and policy. So we don't expect that you necessarily already have a background in this field. Um, and the idea of the writing sample is so that we can see, you know, that what your skills and abilities and level of, of research and writing are currently. So, you know, any sort of academic work or professional work that you're able to share, um, that's the goal of the writing sample. Likewise, with the letter of recommendation, um, you know, in some places, um, it's normal to have a professor do that. In some places, it's not. And so anyone you've worked with in a com professional capacity can serve uh, for that purpose. Once all of those documents have been received, um, then you'll be contacted by the internship coordinator to set up an interview and um, commence the process that way. Um, so once you're onboarded as an intern, um, you will receive an onboarding document, um, which those of you who are already interns have already received. Um, it goes over the requirements and expectations of our programs, um, how to handle any proprietary information or confidential information um, that hasn't yet been publicized while we're working on research projects. It talks about our non-discrimination policy. And then something that's new for this year is um, just conflict of interest disclosure. Because we are now the North American Region Administrator for the Manfred Locks competition, um, we kind of have a little bit of a wall set up within the organization internally. So I myself as an internship coordinator, I'm not going to be um, you know, involved in, in the moot court competition. And so I just need to be notified of any of our interns who are also functioning, uh, um, serving on the moot court team for perhaps their, their school. Um, so please do let me know about that. It's really just to notify and there's nothing else you need to do and, and no other issues arise. Um, and then finally, another new thing for this year is you'll be assigned to an officer as a mentor. So this is um, kind of outside of whatever your regular research or programming projects are. This is just a chance for you to kind of get to know uh, an officer one-on-one -on -one a little bit more and have uh, a mentorship opportunity. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is some new program forms that we have. So uh, on Monday, you'll be getting a copy of any, any current interns, I should say, will be getting a copy of the intern handbook. Um, and within it, you'll have the hyperlinks to the various program forms. And so um, the first form is for an individual intern project. Uh, we really encourage everyone to consider uh, engaging in an individual project during your internship. This gives you a chance to pick any area of space law or policy that you're really interested or passionate about and, and research it and put something together. It, it could be a paper, it could be um, a presentation, it could be something, uh, you know, that could go on a, in a YouTube format. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility with what it could be. Um, and it is a self-driven project, but you'll have the benefit of having um, your officers who are working with you, many of whom are you know, published and, and acting space, uh, space law and policy professionals to you know, edit your work, um, provide you tips and guidance throughout the process. So the first step is to fill out the form where you're considering what project you wanna do. And that will notify me and um, you know, any other officers that I would need to pair you with of what the project is, what you think you're going to need, what support you're going to need. Um, the second form that's new is the intern interest and skills form. So uh, this form is, is filled out just to give all officers a chance to easily see, you know, what are your areas of interest and your background. Um, and this is also a chance for you to provide your bio and photo. Many of you have already emailed me your bio and photo and they're up on the website, which is excellent. Um, this is kind of a, an easier way to keep everything together. So if you want to update your bio and photo, you'll do it through this form. For anyone who's new, this is the way you can um, submit your bio and photo and then we can get it up onto the website. It's not mandatory 
mandatory to put your bio and web uh, your bio and photo up, um, but we do encourage it because we like to highlight. Um, you know, what a great group of people are working with us. Um, and, it, and it can be helpful for future employers or schools to see, you know, that you've been engaged um, and working with us. And then finally, we have the internship program survey. And so um, this is something we do every year. Um, you can still participate in the 2021 survey that came out um, in the late spring of 2021. There will be a new one coming out in the spring of 2022. Um, and much of the suggestions and feedback that I've received already from the survey have helped to uh, create these, these new changes to our program in year two. So the feedback is really welcome. Um, you know, we're a new program and we're growing and, you know, we really, welcome any feedback and ideas and suggestions um, that our interns have to make the program more robust. Um, finally, uh, just going over a few of our activities that we have, um, we have office hours with the internship coordinator, that's me, um, every second Wednesday of the month. And so these are, um, you know, there's no, there's no topic. The idea is I'll just be available on Google Meet Anybody can join to pop in and ask a question or just to chat if you you saw something interesting happened in the world of space law and policy and you want to talk to somebody about it. Um, and so they're set up at 6 to 6.30 a.m. Eastern time and then again at 5 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern time in uh, efforts to accommodate the various time zones of everyone working with our organization. Um, if neither one of those times work for you, please let me know and we can just set up an in individual time whenever it's convenient for you. Um, these are just kind of standing times uh, that anyone can, can pop in, like I said. And then we have the monthly space court cafes uh, where we bring in um, speakers who are space industry professionals. The goal of these cafes is largely to provide you with career advice and networking opportunities so that you can hear from people who have been successful in this field. Um, how did they get going in their career? What do the organizations or companies or you know, government agencies they work at, uh, what do they do? How, how does that work? And it gives you a chance to kind of meet people face to face, which I think is really important um, considering, you know, we're an international organization, it's a virtual setting, um, and being able to put a face with a name can be really helpful as you move forward in your career. So the cafes give you an opportunity to meet really amazing people working in this field um, who were kind enough, you know, to dedicate some time to, to come talk with us. So those are every month. Um, if you can't attend, uh, they are always recorded and that way uh, any interns who can't attend can watch it afterwards. Um, these are internal events just for interns. And then finally, we also have um, new the community classroom. And so the idea for this is to give interns and officers a chance to um, share and educate around a discrete area of space law or policy. So if you've been researching something and you want a chance to kind of you know, present on it and get your feet wet with presenting, or um, you, know, you wanna hear about a specific topic, the community classroom is a chance to do that. Um, and so we've had a really great start um, with one of our interns, Yana Yakushina, who did her presentation actually live on YouTube. So that is accessible for others to watch. Um, the community classroom presentations do not have to be public. It can be just an internal event for those who attend, um, you know, depending on your comfort you know, how comfortable you are. Uh, if, if it's an intern who's pre presenting, um, that's entirely up to you. But again, this is a way to kind of have another educational opportunity to really talk about, you know, uh, a specific area of law or policy that you've been researching or that like one of our officers has been researching and can share with the interns as a group. It's currently set up for the last Thursday of the month at 8 a.m. Eastern time. However, if we don't have um, a volunteer to speak, then uh, it won't happen that month. So it may be that not every month we have the community classroom um, because it's dependent on, on someone volunteering to present. Um, but that is the standing time for when they will occur. 
Um, other useful information that is in the handbook is um, we have a document for lead interns on a research project. Um, and so this just kind of goes over and explains roles and responsibilities. As many of you may know, um, usually someone who may have a level of expertise or um, has an advanced degree or is in an advanced degree program may um, be asked to serve as a lead on a project. And so this document just helps you know, clarify what that role and responsibility is. Um, our, you know, all of our internships are volunteer based, our organization is volunteer based. And so there's a lot of flexibility with hours and deadlines and things like that. And so, you know, people are working at different paces, um, recognizing that it's never the expectation that, you know, a lead intern has to, you know, make sure that that everyone's getting everything done at the same time or anything like that. Um, but it's really to help collaborate um, and, you know, provide a, a channel of communication if there are any issues um, with the team. And then finally, we have officer contact information because although you'll be paired with a mentor um, and you can always contact me, um, we really welcome you to contact any of our officers if you have a question about you know, what they do in the organization or even what they do outside of the organization. Um, you know, we really want to give everyone a chance to get to know everyone in the organization. And so that information is provided as well. And then um, we'll add more to come on Manfred Locks and the research program, which I'm going to, um, we are going to hear about from Chris Hearsey in a minute. Um, with that, if there are any questions, I am happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, you can email me directly with any follow-up questions. And then again, for our current interns, uh, you'll be getting the handbook on Monday and then over the weekend, I will be sending you like a short form to fill out um, just to get confirmation if you plan to continue with the internship into 2022. And that will allow me uh, to then pair you with your mentor. Um, thank you everybody. And with that, I will turn it back to Nathan unless there's um, any questions. All right, thank you very much, Julia. Um, and as Julia mentioned that we are a volunteer organization um, and um, Julia herself is an example of the dedication and selflessness and contribution of personal time uh, that has made our organization a success. And the internship program in particular has been a success because of officers like, and especially Julia herself. So thank you. Um, now we turn to our next speaker, Chris Hearsey, the other co-founder of the Space Corp Foundation and chair of the board of directors. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience in the aerospace and nonprofit sectors, including working at Bigelow Aerospace, serving as special assistant to the director in the Office of Space and Advanced Technology at the US Department of State and holding a graduate fellowship in space history at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. He graduated with honors from the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law and studied public international law at Downing College in the University of Cambridge. He is currently Chief Space Liaison Officer for Space Hero and Chief Executive Officer for ExoLaunch USA. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to uh, be here for our intern orientation this year. Uh, we've made such great progress and I certainly want to thank uh, Julia for being such a wonderful manager and coordinator for our interns and uh, very excited to speak to you today. Um, hang on one second. Let me make sure my camera was looks better. There we go. So I'm um, speaking to you today in my capacity as the uh, co-founder of Space Corps Foundation and the chair of the board of directors, and also uh, the coordinator for the research program as head of the editorial board. Uh, also should mention that our director of legal research is Nivi Raju. Uh, unfortunately, she uh, is not being able to uh, be here today. So with that, uh, let's get in to uh, why should you apply to be a Space Court research intern? Well, as uh, Nathan and Julie have mentioned, you know, we 
provide exposure and learning opportunities in space law and public international law. Um, we're providing mentorship opportunities. We want to help young professionals and students build their professional networks. And I think most importantly, practice your legal research skills. If you're going to do anything with space law in the future, either as an academic or a practitioner or just general interest, it's very important uh, to keep practicing those legal research skills, learning how to conduct research, where to find the materials, and eventually um, how to analyze and synthesize them. But I think the other part of being a part of the Space Court Foundation and uh, being an intern is you're a part of a global community of people that have an interest in space law and the rule of law. And I think this is very important, especially for those who do want to go on to practice uh, law in some capacity, whether it's in, in space law, public international law, or other areas of law. It, it's, it's good to know who uh, your other colleagues are and learn from them and learn about other opportunities uh, as you advance your career. So how can you get involved in space court research activities? Well, first apply to the internship program. Make sure that you consider what your interests are, whether you have uh, a very clear picture or you are looking to learn more about a particular subject, that's great. This is something where we will provide uh, our advisors, our staff and other interns to speak with you uh, about their expertise, the research they're doing, and you're always welcome to speak with Julia, myself, or Nivi about those research topics. Once you go through that basic process, we'll pick a research project, we'll negotiate the time and the outcomes for your research project, and then we'll get you started on the research. So what can you do as an intern? We currently have four subcommittees, one which is in operation, three that will uh, begin uh, next year. The projects that we're focusing on is uh, listed here. We're, we're calling the uh, Collection of National Space Law's Primary Sources, so the Black Letter Law, not Policy, the Big Book of National Space Law, which we should be able to publish a first draft in the new year. Um, this uh, initial draft will uh, include U.S. space law, uh, Russian and Soviet space law, and some selected European space law. Uh, to follow on with that, we will be also publishing a legal research guide that contains links and other sources for you to find those materials and to research in the databases to see what other countries are doing uh, when it comes to regulating space activities. Uh, our big projects uh, that are coming down the pipeline are the International Yearbook of Space Activities, which will be a collection of primary sources and explanations and methodologies in law that apply to space law and give both the general public uh, practitioners and students a general sense of what is law, what is space law, what applies. And then we will follow on uh, through the introduction of analysis and other materials, which will get at what is custom international agreements and general principles of law when it comes to space law. We are also working towards a space law lexicon, which will be a somewhat of a dictionary of legal terms cross-referenced across all primary sources of law. And finally, um, in terms of our big projects, we have been working on a chronological compendium of space law, which will be uh, uh, links uh, that we'll put on our website so that you can see in time from the 1930s or so, all the way to the present, all the different laws that have been enacted by governments uh, that regulate space activities. Um, as part of our internship program, we do, as Julie mentioned, um, offer individual projects. Um, we want to encourage those who have a particular passion for a topic or an area of law uh, to develop and present your research uh, to our interns and to our staff, get feedback. And this also includes those in advanced programs working on their thesis or dissertation. Um, We're happy to have you present to us and provide some feedback um, uh, and uh, help you uh, flesh out any issues or at least present your final uh, presentations after you've given your defense and give you an opportunity uh, to let everyone know what you've been working on. And finally, uh, we are also, as an online internship program, as sort of an online organization that's global, we have several initiatives where 
we are encouraging interns to participate in social media content creation. And the four areas where we invite you is first, uh, if you've seen, we've uh, published the pilot called Stellar Decisis or animated series about space law. Um, we're always looking for help to do research on subsequent episodes. We're currently working on two episodes. One uh, is crime on the moon and two is state sovereignty on Mars. Uh, next, uh, we have several interns working on social uh, media posts, uh, looking at space law, space policy, space history, current events. Um, so we always need help uh, with that. So if you're good at graphic design um, or you have an interest uh, on doing Instagram posts, uh, Facebook posts, Twitter posts, uh, we encourage you to let Julian know and we will get you uh, into that, uh, that group. We also have a pilot project, which uh, is basically a public international legal case law research program. What we're seeking to do is look currently at two different public, seminal public international legal cases, uh, one of them being uh, Corfu and the other being Lotus. The idea here is to provide a story about uh, those cases and why it's important to space law. We're also looking at other, other public international legal cases that are important to space law and put together a, a basically YouTube video explaining you know, what happened, what happened in the case, what happened in the court and what happened with the uh, participants of that case, whether they were the responder, the applicant, uh, the prosecutor, defendant, depending upon the case. And finally, uh, we invite our interns if they have an interest in script writing, uh, comedy, drama, uh, sci-fi knowledge. Uh, we are also looking for research and script writing help for the Space Bar Show, which we have launched the pilot in May. Uh, that is a fictional program that Nathan and I uh, started, and we are currently um, working on developing four additional episodes, which we hope to publish next year. And the premise of the Space Bar Show is it's a space station far, far uh, out in the in the solar system somewhere. And the proprietor of the bar is HAL 9001. Uh, he's a reformed AI program. And Nathan and I uh, are the fictional space lawyers who helped him get legal personhood and back pay for uh, his, his uh, previous job. And uh, we, <laughs> we've uh, been working with um, several folks, including Ben Corbin, who has done a lot of our music. And so if you're interested in parody songs about space law, or space activities in general, then uh, please check out uh, the Space Bar Show on our YouTube channel. So what is the structure currently? Um, we have the editorial board that sits on, on, uh, on the top of the structure. Uh, we are currently running the subcommittee on methodologies and definitions, which um, is helping us sort through all the different data that we are uh, looking into, uh, which is primary sources of space law which we're going to put into all the different products that I mentioned previously. And then starting in the spring, we're gonna stand up three additional committees, subcommittees rather, one on custom, one on international agreements, and one on general principles of law. Um, the research in these subcommittees will feed into the International Yearbook of Space Activities. In particular, uh, with the custom subcommittee, what essentially we're doing is seeing if we can identify a pineal urus, um, and also leverage our lexicon to see if we can define general consistent state practices and pair them together and make some analysis about uh, what we see as, as an organization uh, going on in terms of trends uh, for customer international law. Um, but the Subcommittee on International Agreements will be looking at uh, the treaties themselves, looking at the, the history of the treaties, the definitions, as well as its application to foreign relations laws of different countries to look at how everything sort of connects together uh, from what we understand as the regulation of space activities, public international law, national regulation, and then the implementation of all those legal rules. And finally, uh, the general principles of law subcommittee will also look to see if there are trends uh, in space law that rise to the level of general principles. Uh, part of the reason is you can see the subcommittee of methodologies and definitions feeds into these three subcommittees. So, while those are, are currently in, in operation, if you have a background in comparative legal uh, theory or law, um, please let Julia know. Uh, I think this would be a great opportunity uh, for those who have that sort of background. So our current phases, as I mentioned, um, 
for the last uh, couple of years and into next year, we are going to finish up data collection and categorization of the primary sources of space law materials that we've collected. And then we will move uh, starting next year into the publication of some of the materials that I mentioned, uh, first starting with the big book of space law and the uh, research guide. Uh, we'll eventually stand up uh, an actual uh, page on our website, which we will call the Space Court Law Library, which we will be able to access all these materials. And then we will begin our research projects in the subcommittees that I mentioned. Following on from that, uh, starting in, in 23 to 24, we're going to uh, put up the publication of the International Yearbook of Space Activities uh, and then start preparing our first drafts of the Space Law Lexicon. So there's a lot going on. I'll, um, and we think that all the materials that we are developing will be very useful uh, to the entire community, the general public to fully understand, or at least partially understand what is space law? Um, how does it sort of function? Um, give practitioners and students the ability to uh, utilize uh, resources uh, in their work and um, bring together uh, lots of different uh, organizations, which we are partnering with, um, to give a more robust understanding to the basic question, the research question that we have, which is what is space law? What is it composed of? And then eventually how does it function? And what does it mean uh, both for space activities and the future of the rule of law in space? So with that, I wanna thank all the current and past interns for their contributions to the research program. Uh, we, we hope that when we publish, you will finally see all the great work that our interns have done and our staff have done to put together quality products that are interesting and present data in, in a different way, in a new way, uh, and also give people perspective on what is space law and how does the rule of law function with respect to space activities, especially as we get people further and further working and living uh, from Earth or away from Earth. So with that, uh, I am done with my presentation and thank you. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, to answer them. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and yes, we do want to encourage uh, attendees on the Zoom webinar to uh, submit questions in their Q and A. Um, and if we don't answer them live here during this session, then we will follow up. And then, of course, you can find us online through our social media. Uh, and our email addresses on the website. All right, so we are going to now turn to our panel event uh, today. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce the moderator, Mac Lee Carroll, Deputy Executive Director for the Space Court Foundation. Uh, Mac Lee is a graduate of the International Institute of Air and Space Law at Leiden University, where he wrote his master's thesis on the regulation of commercial spaceports worldwide. He also served as the executive secretary for the Space Generation Advisory Council and an active member of their diversity action team, as well as effective and adaptive governance for a lunar ecosystem, EGLE, action team. He uh, is also the program director for the Caribbean Space Society, a working group of the Institute of Caribbean Studies that aims to establish a unified Caribbean space agenda. Welcome, Mac Lee. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Julia, and all the officers that helped organizing this event. Again, uh, welcome to the Space Corps Foundation's second annual intern orientation. As a deputy exec, I'm pretty, pretty excited about today's panel, not only because it's a who's who in space law policy, but because I can guarantee that the connective knowledge of all our panelists here on navigating the professional aspect of the industry will be insightful to all, regardless of where you are in the beginning of your career. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our panelists, okay? First, you can't have space industry without satellites. They are one of the foundational elements with, of the space industry. So with that said, I'm proud to introduce Therese Jones, the Senior Director of Policy at the Satellite Industry Association. For those who might not be aware, SIA is a US-based trade association representing over 50 satellite operators, manufacturers, ground equipment suppliers, and launch capacities um, companies. In this capacity, Therese leads working groups on regulatory, legislative, defensive, cyber security, space sustainability, expert controls, you name it, 
Therese is over it, okay? Additionally, she's a co-founder of the Z Factor Fellowship, founder of AIAA Diversity Scholarship, a member of the Board of Advisors for the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, and a founding partner of spaceinterns.org. So welcome, Therese. Next, we have the Executive Secretary of the European Center for uh, Space Law, Rosanna Hoffman. As part of ECSL, Rosanna promotes space law through interactive, educational, and networking events for students, young professionals alike. On top of that, she's doing a young graduate training in the Public International Law Division at ESA. She was also part of the Manfred Locke Space Law Moot Court team, like a, a, a couple of people here, from the University of Vienna in 2019-2020. And she did not only win the European rounds, but was also awarded the runner up, as well as the Eileen Galloway Award for the world's best memorial. Before joining ECSL and ESA, Rosanna worked at the Section for International Law and International Relations at the University of Vienna as an assistant lecturer and project assistant. Her areas of expertise covered public international law, as well as space law. And right now she is currently pursuing her PhD at the University of Cologne, where she is specializing in you guessed it, space law. Okay, next we have live from Luxembourg by way of Italy, Antonino Salmeri. He's a space lawyer specializing in lunar governance and space resource activities. Since 2019, Antonino has been working as a doctoral researcher in space law at the University of Luxembourg, where he's pursuing a PhD on the regulatory and enforcement aspects of space mining. Antonino also holds three advanced degrees in law from the University of Leiden, my alma mater, Rome, and um, Catania. And he's also a qualified attorney registered at the Italian bar. Like our other panelists, Antonino holds, the, holds many positions in the space community, um, including a policy and, ad, advisor, and advocacy coordinator for the Space Generation Advisory Council, where he also leads the Eagle team that I'm a part of that Nathan had talked about earlier. He's also a member of the expert group on sustainable lunar activities, um, Gexla for the Moon Village Association. And he also co-chairs a first subgroup on lunar information sharing. And among his many other accolades, he's also the chair of International Agreements Committee for our Space Law Library Project. And last but not least, we have Ruvumbo Saminga from Zimbabwe, who unfortunately could not be with us here today because last minute she was called to assignment. But fortunately, she was able to pre-record her part of the panel and that will play just after. Just for some quick background, Rumbo is a space law policy analyst that specializes in the African new space industry. She was recently named uh, one of CNN's women shaping African space exploration, and she currently works as a research fellow for Open Lunar Foundation and is a founder of Agrispace, a startup that is combining agriculture, business, and the space industry. Like the rest of our panels, there's so much more amazing thing that we have done. So I hope I was able to do everybody's justice by um, everyone's bio justice. And yeah, so let's let's start right into it. So this panel is professionalism in space and legal industries. So go from the top. What does professionalism mean to you? And I'll toss this off to you, Therese, because you're right on my screen. Perfect. So thanks so much to the Space, space Court Foundation for having me. I'm very excited to get all of your questions and hopefully meet uh, some of you as you go through your internship. Um, so in working with students and young professionals specifically, uh, some of the things that stick out to me in terms of professionalism um, are being communicative um, with the people that you're working with, um, being prompt to respond to them, um, especially if you're asking something of that person, um, being sure that you are timely, um, both in your responses and prompt for meetings. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've had students show up late to meetings with me um, without any warning or just not show up at all. Um, that doesn't get you off on a good foot. Um, being clear with your expectations, um, being clear, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you know, we all understand that you're here to learn. Um, definitely appreciate if you have questions and if you're, you know, in an internship, um, asking questions um, both about subject matter or just clarifying directions can help solve a lot of problems that you might run into later. Um, also being independent. Um, so if, you know, you're given a five step set of directions, being sure that you read and understand those set of directions um, before, you know, calling your boss and uh, asking a billion questions. Um, and yeah, uh, also being clear with what your goals are and what you want out of your internship. I had 
an intern at one point who was a relative of my boss and she was at a networking event asked why she wanted to go into the space industry and she was like oh my great uncle is uh my the runs this organization um not a good response <laughs> um we love students who are passionate about space though and I, i'm sure you all are but just being able to encapsulate that in you know 30 seconds and share that with people is very helpful Great, great points, especially from the beginning about being communicative, especially during this post pandemic time where people are getting burnout and feeling weird and stuff. And especially the last part, too, about knowing why you want to be in the industry and what you want from it. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be 100% clear, but you know, you should still have a clear vision. Great answers. Um, Rosanna, off to you. What do you think professionalism means to you? Or what does it mean to you? So I couldn't agree more with what Teresa uh, said, especially being timely. Um, I feel that is something that 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 often gets forgotten. Um, that this this the small thing you do can go such a long way. Um, but for me, it also means, um, on the one hand, being passionate with what you do. So again, <laughs> Teresa's example of 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 the one intern saying, "Well, she's here." because her, her great grandfather or, or, or whoever owns the organization, um, that, that doesn't show that you're passionate for what you're doing. Um, really, really know for yourself that you're doing this because this is exactly what you want to do. If it's space law, if it's space policy, if it's international law, really show that this is what you want to do in the future. And uh, another thing, I only have two, two examples of professionalism. Uh, what they mean to me is being a team player. Uh, especially we're going to be talking probably about um, uh, multicultural aspects as well and, and working in an international field, etc. It's so important to work well in a team, um, especially considering that, that the field of space law and space policy is very interdisciplinary. You're going to have to work with engineers, with technicians, you're going to work with people where you maybe do not have the same, let's say, personal views, et cetera, but just working with them well as a team on a, on a, in, in the work you do just goes such a long way and, and is for me what, what professionalism means. That was a good point. Being a team player is huge, I feel like especially in, in the space industry, like you said, and that makes me, reminds me of the Outer Space Treaty, space for the benefit of all humankind. That should be the crux. That should be what drives the space industry. Everybody, we're one big team together. Um, great, great response. And um, last but not least, Antonino, what does professionalism mean to you? I personally know Antonino, by the way, just for, for context, and he's one of the most professional people I've ever met. So. <laughs> Thank you, Miklia. That's very kind of you to say. And thanks to the Space Corps Foundation for inviting me today. Uh, it's great to be, um, to be here with such also great panelists. So hi to um, Rosanna and Therese. Uh, great to see you. So. Much of what professionalism is has already been said by my fellow panelists, so I don't have much to add. But there are a couple of things that I think could complete this idea of professionalism. One is uh, recognizing your responsibilities and owning to your mistakes. Uh, meaning that, of course, a professional is not somebody who is infallible. We all can make mistakes. That happens. Uh, we're not always right. Uh, but being a professional means that you recognize your mistake and you own to it. And then you hopefully fix it as well, as long as you can. So that means that you recognize clearly what are your responsibilities in a team, in an organization, in, in a project, anywhere. Um, and then you, you realize that if you fail to meet your responsibilities, uh, you, uh, you first of all acknowledge it. And then um, you try to take action to remove any negative consequences you may have created. So many times I've seen people uh, failing in what they were supposed to do and always finding excuses, justifications for whatever reason could happen. Uh, and sometimes it's fine. Sometimes it's not our fault. But I think being a professional means that you recognize that in any case, you have a certain responsibility and you got you to gotta live up to that. And a second component of professionalism for me means also the ability of removing your personal idiosyncrasies into your job. That means that if you do, don't like somebody, you're still able to work with that person. That if you don't like a certain environment or, or any type of situation that you have a personal preference on, you're still able to be a professional. That means that you're there for a, for a certain reason to perform a certain function. And so whatever you think personally should not get in the way of that. And that also means that when you have a relationship with your colleagues, with your superiors, 
um, whoever is involved, you are, you have, you don't take things personally. You, as long as people don't attack you personally, <laughs> of course, unfortunately there are unprofessional people who would go on, on a personal level to, you know, you know, in a professional environment. And that's so wrong, right? Professional means to me that there is a separation between uh, the personal sphere, personal preferences, and uh, the fact that you are in a working environment and you have to pursue um, a certain function there. Um, so those are the two things that I would add um, to, uh, to the definition of professionalism that was already brilliantly uh, defined previously. Great, great points. I like that. Too. I love that. Removing your personal bias because it's just a work, it's just a job, like everything. that we, Even though we are so passionate about it, it might be hard to do that. But at the end of the day, you know, it's still we still have a goal in mind. Let's just do this. And it connects to what Rosanna was saying. Let's just do this as a team. And then, you know, which then connects to what Therese was saying about being communicative and timely and prompt. You guys, you will all just hit, hit all the points for it. Um, so now for the next question, I want to ask you, Anthony, so I'll just like work backwards so it's not like the same order kind of thing. So, um, and just by its very nature, it's arguable that space law is the most international field out there. I mean, you can't do this like a, in a silo, like uh, Rosano was saying, you have to be a team player. So with that said, can you share a moment in which you had a cross-cultural exchange that led you to expand or reflect your own views of professionalism? It is a great question. Um, and as I was thinking about it, it's difficult to isolate a specific moment, right? I think every career has different steps. Um, so you'll forgive me if I give you two answers. Uh, one is a general answer, which is like a certain moment of my career when I started in space law, which was studying in Leiden. Um, being in, in Leiden at the, at the International Institute of Air and Space Law, as the very name says, was um, a, an incredibly important um, moment of my personal also development in the sense that it, it taught me how to be in a multinational, multicultural environment. And Leiden has this great merit of collecting together so many different people from all over the world. So over one year, you know, that is the type of growth that you can have when you're constantly confronted with that environment. Uh, and another, another example I want to give is an actual moment, so something that is more shorthanded in time, which is when I did the Space Generation Fusion Forum in, in Colorado Springs. Uh, so that's one of the, I think, most wonderful events that SGC organizes all over the world, uh, probably my favorite, um, because of how the event is organized. And SGFF is, as the word says, is a fusion of different people, different cultures, different disciplines. And, and you stay there three days with, with, with people that are so diverse and that have so much things to contribute that that, that changes something in you. At least it, it did it for me. So it was, um, it was one of my, my most transformative events because in just three days, it really inspired me. Uh, and it really taught me the value that you have when you're such a cohort of different and diverse uh, people um, together working on, on something that we all love. So those are the two uh, ideas. I would say there is a more slow process that doesn't happen overnight, that it's the, the ability of getting adjust to this multicultural environment. And then there are certain times in which everything of that comes together in one, you know, one moment you see, okay, this is certainly uh, transformative. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. And as um, Nathan had said for, for the attendees, I was also a graduate of Leiden, the International Institute. And I remember in my class, I was the only American person there. And then, you know, anytime anything in America happened, everyone looked at, let's look at the American guy and get his take on it. This is a funny experience. Um, uh, Rosanna, to you, what do you think, um, or can you share a moment in which you had a cross-cultural exchange to help you expand your views of professionalism or just reflect in general? I have to say this one was a difficult one and I, and I can't really think of one, one specific moment to be quite honest. And, and I'll, therefore I'll actually also give two examples, not really moments, but examples. On the one hand, maybe just, just for understanding. So I grew up in South Africa and, and Norway, mm -hmm. but as a German citizen. So, so already there for me, cross-cultural experiences have always been on the one hand easy let's say because I've already had this international background but on the other hand also also difficult because um, what culture do I then want to represent uh, so so that 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 can be difficult but as an example um, actually and let's let's stay with space law when I started preparing for the space law mood court competition. We were a team uh, consisting of, of myself, then, then an Austrian national and a Bulgarian national. So also quite an international team, although we were representing the University of Vienna, of course, but 
but we were we were um, quite, I would say, multicultural in that aspect. And there were a lot of stereotypes that we at the beginning um, threw at each other's faces. Uh, I don't know, one always being late, the other one being too timely, um, the one being too strict, the other one too too not strict with 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 things. Where we realized that 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 that's crazy. Even in a European context, we're not talking outside Europe here. Even in a European context, that this that this might cause friction. And in the end, though, we really learned from these differences from each other. We were extremely good friends now. I, I work together with 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 one of my my colleagues, even from the team. And and what I'm trying to say with this example, uh, if I'm not bringing my point across yet, is that. Cross-cultural exchange is there to learn from each other, to learn from other cultures, to learn how um, one can actually adapt and, 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 and how this can help in, in your own work. The same goes for starting at the European Space Agency. There's 22 um, uh, nationalities represented at ESA, again, European, but there's a lot of cultures within Europe, believe me. And uh, an Italian, and again, I don't like stereotypes, but sometimes one can see it works maybe differently than let's say a Norwegian and just learning from these different um, ways of working and dealing with problems and, and, and uh, uh, things is, is fantastic. I mean, now being able to have a three course meal for lunch, I, I absolutely love and I'll continue with it, but no jokes aside, um, really learn from each other when it comes to working cross-culturally. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that 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 moment, Rosanna. It's real candid. I really appreciate it, especially how you're saying, because yeah, cross-cultural exchange stereotypes is almost embedded in that, like that, like you'll be coming face to that. So I, I'm glad that you're able to address that. Um, and Therese, off to you. Can Thanks. You I got a couple moment? examples. Um, so the first one is when I was a grad student, um, I got selected uh, to go to IAC, sponsor, the International Astronautical Congress, sponsored by NASA. And there were groups of students there sponsored by a bunch of different space agencies across the globe. So NASA, Canadian Space Agency, ESA, uh, CARI, JAXA, um, the Australians had people there as well. I'm not sure if it's expanded since then. I encourage you all to apply if you are eligible, by the way. Um, it was a great time. But meeting my Japanese and Korean colleagues, they all had gifts for all of the students present because that's part of their culture. Um, and I remember feeling really embarrassed because NASA told us nothing about this. None of us knew that that was like a custom in Japan and Korea. Um, and they were lovely about the whole thing, but I just wish we had knew, known a little bit more about the cultures of Japan and Korea before we had gotten together with those students. Um, and that was a wonderful time. Um, and then also I participated um, to some extent on the inter at the international level at the UN, um, both at the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and at UN conferences. Um, and that has really highlighted so how geopolitical issues can sometimes, uh, you know, trump whatever the issue at hand is. For instance, during the negotiations of the long-term sustainability guidelines, there were many issues with Russia and the Russians were claiming that things didn't translate well from English into Russian, but it was really a tactic to stall because they, mm. you know, geopolitically opposed the US and the Europeans um, and were just trying to block what was going on. Um, they also hosted the first UN conference on space law and policy. And I'm there like very, it was probably my first year on this job. So fresh out of uh, grad school, thinking it's going to be this great space law and policy conference. And they start by their deputy foreign minister giving a like half hour long speech in Russian about how the US is an aggressor in space to start like this multinational conference. Um, so, so being aware of the geopolitical issues uh, at hand and also knowing never to drink vodka with the Russians, which they plied people with at the reception. Um, one of the Chinese colleagues uh, showed up half an hour late to his own panel the next day uh, due to friendship through vodka. Um, so also knowing what's expected of you and you know maintaining that professionalism as you work with your colleagues is important. That last part, you, you summed it up right there, knowing what to expect and then and then how that reflects with professionalism. Because yeah, if, you, if your one colleague knew that he or she would be drinking all night, you know, but when you have a presentation the next day, like, yeah, that really, you, you really nailed it with that one. Um, I see that we have a question in, uh, in the queue, but I'll ask that after I go through these panels, um, through these other questions, I mean. Um, 
So let me start with you, Rosanna, for the third question. Okay, and here's a question that interns in any level of their career can appreciate. Can you share a tip that you received starting out in your career on regarding how to handle difficult or tense conversations or interactions? I guess I wonder if, if that would have um, applied in your, your Manfred Locks blue court situation or other times in your career. Um, I mean, yes, there's, there's two tips. Uh, the, the second one for sure also applies to the mood court competition. Um, but the first one may be more to, to where I'm working now and where I worked before in the ministry of justice, where, where you have a lot of hierarchy, etc. um, is that you never know what the person you're, you're, you're dealing with or the person you're talking to, be it your colleague or, or um, the counterpart part in a no negotiation or whoever, your boss, you never know what they're dealing with privately, right? You never know if they've had a terrible morning, a terrible week, um, I don't know, conflict at home, etc. And, and then they're just having a bad day. And, and you personally think it's, it's you. Um, most of the times... And this I can only say from, from my work experience, it's probably not you. It is something either coming from above, some, some um, stress at work or at home, et cetera. So this is something that you should always think about first before being completely devastated because you think you know there's been some negative feedback, et cetera. Um, another thing, and this is <clears throat> something that you can actually do for yourself. And this is actually also one of the, I would say, points of being professional or points of, of professionalism is being prepared. So if you know that you're going to be in a tense situation uh, because something that you're, um, I don't know, a, a contract you're negotiating is going to be difficult, or you know that you're going to be with a counterpart that doesn't completely agree with your views on, let's say, space law, then just be completely prepared. Do your due diligence, um, do your research, because then you won't have a problem in the tense situation to answer the questions that might be, let's say, tense or difficult, because you're prepared. You've done everything you could do. And this is also for the competition. I don't know, maybe there are there are interns here that are you know, not done with their law degree yet, and, and they're thinking of taking part in something like the mood court competition. Um, you're going to get far here as well if you're prepared, if you're prepared for every question you might get by judges. So but the same thing goes, um, the same thing can be said for for any work situation. So but I'll stop there. <laughs> Those are great points. I'm glad you mentioned preparation. I was just looking up that adage. I was like, how did it go again? Proper planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. So yeah, always be prepared. And like, and your points about working with colleagues too, um, yeah, you shouldn't make assumptions and or take things personal because you don't know what they're going through. And yeah, which I guess ties into the beginning of what Therese was saying about communication. And you were also saying that about communication too. That's communication really helps alleviate these things, communication and preparation. Um, Therese, any tips, any tips you received that helps you handle tense or difficult interactions in the space industry? Sure. Um, so a bit more about my job. Um, we've got over 50 different member companies um, and we're a consensus based organization. So I need all of those companies to sign off on anything we put out. So there are many, many tense situations um, given the you know wide range of stakeholders in the satellite industry. Um, so I'm not really allowed to have my own opinion. I just drive consensus um, amongst all of our members. So a bit different than you know being an in-house lawyer at a company where you're advocating for you know a specific policy position. Um, but I think you, again, the communication part's really key. Um, having a very clear agenda and you know high-level um, you know goals that you want. Um, it, sending things around like an outline in advance um, can really help. Um, you know, clarify what you're going to talk about, allow people to prepare in advance. Um, and then uh, I've also found, you know, holding in-person meetings when possible, or I mean, these days, video uh, meetings um, to talk things out has really helped. Um, but just being persistent and, um, you know, having multiple meetings on issues that you know are tense, um, I think has been really helpful for me to help resolve some of these issues. Nice, yeah. Those I can't believe you said you need all consensus for for your thing to work. That that must make it difficult. But yeah, being prepared works. Um, Antonina, how about you? Any tips that you can share? And just for context, Antonina was a group lead for a project group I was in with about seventeen of us. I don't think, from my perspective, anything's got difficult or tense. But Antonina, you might have more light to share on that, or any other tip that you received. 
Definitely. And I think, yeah, the, the Eagle team is probably a good example of how we can work together, you know, with people from different backgrounds, different nationalities. We were like, uh, I think, from 11 countries and, and we got engineers, scientists, lawyers, uh, people from all different fields. And yeah, I think it also depends on the people, right? I think uh, I was privileged enough to, and I'm still privileged enough to, to lead a group of wonderful human beings and great professionals. So that obviously makes a difference uh, in everything in life, including you, of course. Uh, but one of the tips that I received, and that is something that I, I found particularly useful, is uh, that when things are tense and when you, when you are in that situation where you see there is tension, uh, let things cool down. So to try to deconflate the situation by taking a step back, taking a deep breath and, you know, try not to um, get too involved in the situation. And if you have time to put time between things, that's the best thing you can do, right? Because on the spot, it's easily to get turned on. It's easily to get, you know, sometimes because we're passionate, we, we tend to see things the wrong way or too impulsive, too quick. So if you can like sit on, on something for one night and think about it the day after, uh, almost 90% of the time, you will see that the reaction you had was probably a little bit too much. And that thinking about it with some more, <laughs> let's say a little bit later than, than the situation, it helps you um, reduce the tension and therefore take, make better decisions. That was one advice that was given to me because uh, as, as a person, again, the importance, I think, of dividing your, your, your professionalism from who you are also as a person to a certain extent. Uh, I tend to be very impulsive and I have very passionate characters and I tend to be uh, sometimes too quick in, in, in my judgment. And that is some, the part of my character I've been working on as a professional. And, and one of my supervisors told me, you know, don't get, don't, don't be anxious in, in doing things, just relax. And we'll talk about it tomorrow morning and you'll see that uh, we can, we can make a better decision. And, and honestly, even though it conflicts with my natural tendency of acting and, and do something, it, it helps. So unless you are in a, in a crisis where, you know, somebody's about to launch a nuclear missile and you need to decide on the spot, uh, I would say um, take some time to reflect. That usually helps. At least that was a good advice for me. You know, relax, sit back uh, and think about twice before before writing an email, before making a comment, because you can always see other sides of something when, when, you, when you take some more time to, uh, to reflect on it. That's a great point, taking more time to reflect, a good strategy of de-escalating things. Um, and that actually wants me branching off this question. Um, is there a specific situation where, um, where you, know, you were engaging with people, they had different views from you completely about a particular position or policy? And then how did your values on professionalism come into play during that interaction? And I guess the value I want to talk about is um, the de-escalating and like letting time time pass by. Uh, you want me to start? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Branching off. There, yeah. <laughs> no, no reason. problem. Uh, just want to make sure. Um, so, again, I think that this is, uh, this is something that I wanted to share is the Eagle team is a great situation of that, right? Because even though... We never escalated to actual tensions or conflicts. Um, so for context, I, I think it's about time we clarify this a little bit, is that we had um, we had to develop the position of SGC, so the Space Generation Advisory Council, on lunar governance. So we were entrusted to you know, think about what the young generation want, want to see in a lunar governance system and therefore make proposals on, on what do we want to have in, in international and also national regulation. So we've been, we've been discussing a lot among us. We worked for nine months to produce a report that you can find online. It's How many people were in that? Governance. Sorry. How many people were in that? Just to... uh, 14. We were 14. We still are. <laughs> but although now we are a little bit slow in activities, but the bulk uh, is 14 people in the Eagle team. Uh, and so we did a work in different phases. The first phase that we met with people from the space industry, uh, we did interviews or as we call them hearings to you know, get perspectives. And it, it often happened that we did, at least I personally disagree with some of the people we invited. And, and nevertheless, you know, it was important as a professional to, to show respect of, of the people who took time to speak with us and, and then make sure that all voices can be heard. Even voices that sometimes we disagree Strongly, I remember we had uh, Meckley, probably you you will remember, we don't make any names because we, we work on the Chatham House rules, but we got some pretty intense discussion about the importance of the rule of law in space, right? And we got people uh, that came and said, no, there, should be, there shouldn't be any regulation. People in space should be free to do whatever they want and we shouldn't care for what they do on an asteroid because, you know, it's, it's their freedom and stuff like that. Something that as a lawyer, uh, I completely disagree on also. I find it illegal, but <laughs> besides my, my legal judgment, I would love for, for them to be rules. 
but that did, that didn't give me the right to silence the person who was talking to us, right? Or to or to then be disrespectful. So it was difficult to let it sink in, but of course it was useful to include that perspective. And the same happened when we were actually drafting the report, right? So we came up with a proposal for a lunar governance charter and for the regulation of lunar activities. And we, 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 we threw into that proposal some topics that, that we thought were important and some proposals on how to regulate these topics. So you probably remember we had an extensive discussion about benefit sharing, for instance. Should mm -hmm. we, as young generation, encourage benefit sharing um, mechanism for uh, lunar activities and how do we do that? And we got a lot of different views, actually. This was one of the most surprising meetings that I had in the Eagle team because you would expect that young people would say, yes, let's share all the benefits of space activities and everybody will be fine. We got people that were pretty strong on it. They said, no, we should not encourage this too much because it would go to the detriment of pioneers and then people would not invest and therefore we would do nothing. And honestly, I was a little bit shocked, right? But again, the thing was that let's, let's try to find a common ground. Let's try to see where we can merge. What are your reasons for that? Understanding why somebody thinks in a certain way uh, and then try, try to compromise. I think those are the most important things you can do when you are in those situations, right? If you, if you just make a wall and you oppose whatever the other person is saying in the name of a principle, uh, then that doesn't lead you very far, right? So you, you'll need to find a way to agree. And of course, most of the times this falls on the chair. So as Thierry said, you know, the difficulty of finding consensus, it's, it's also the, the responsibility and the privilege of the chair. Um, but th there are tools um, to do that. Uh, and, and again, the, I think one of the keys is not to let your own personal um, preference and opinion in the middle of consensus and of group working. Thanks. That was a great example of the, the discussion we had on benefit sharing. Because I remember thinking at the time, like, how is someone against benefit sharing? How are a couple people against it? But then you're right, you do hear their position. And I was like, oh, I could kind of see how that would how it worked that way. Thank you. That was a great example. Um, Rosanna, so to you, can you share a specific moment where you had different views about uh, policy or position? And then how did your own values of professionalism come into play? I'm thinking like, you know, maybe something from your, your moot court, because that sounds like a good example, because stereotypes are being flown or just anything else from your professional life. So, I mean, I don't have a moot court example right now. I'm sure there are many, uh, but I can't think of one right now. But I actually have an example from just a few, just lately, a, a little while back, where I was invited to speak on on, on space law. Um, and, and there were a lot of very um, known experts there speaking on space law as well. And, and especially the, the topic of space law that can be um, one where, where there are a lot of diverging views. I mean, we just heard one now with, with you know, in, in connection with, 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 um, with the moon, for example, but there's a lot of other areas that are, that are difficult uh, to, to have one opinion on. But then I was at this, this, this conference and um, I and another speaker were asked the same question and uh, the other speaker answered it first. And the speaker's view was one where, where I personally was, was very shocked of the answer. And, and my view is completely different. Um, and it's also, I was also there in a, in a professional capacity. So of course, you know, you have to say professional, you can't say, you know, um, I'm, I'm of a different view. This is this this can't be the correct answer. Um, how can you say something like that? No, you have to stay completely professional, and um, it's difficult, of course, because especially again here, I wouldn't call myself an expert yet um, working on that. But these were really highly renowned experts. So what do you do? You can say I'm of a different opinion, but what you can do is you can try to. Um, work around the question and say, well, indeed, the points you're making are valid, but have you thought of looking at, at it from this perspective? Wouldn't it make more sense that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I sadly can't um, mention the exact question, but you can, you can imagine there are, you know, specific areas of space like currently that are very highly discussed. Um, so again, here, staying professional, making sure that your counterpart, you know, you're not attacking your counterpart. That's not the point of a discussion. As Therese said, um, maybe not in the context of a, of a conference, but, but also at work, you know, reaching consensus is, is, the, is the whole point. Um, and, and that will only work if you, if you listen to what the other person is saying and still try to bring your view over, though. Uh, don't disregard your own view. 
uh, just because someone else has a different view. Well said, that's perfect. Um, it just makes me think of all the geopolitical things that happen. So, you know, sometimes we're just, we're, we're biased without even knowing. So, and I guess it's the whole point of being biased, but um, so yeah, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, Therese, can you share um, a moment in which you had like a specific, and I guess, you know, being in an organization with that governs 50 other smaller companies, this probably happens a lot, but can you share um, a, a moment where there was diverging views and how your values of professionalism came into play in that action? Absolutely. <laughs> so I already mentioned the long-term sustainability guidelines, but uh, overall, as an organization, we work on orbital debris mitigation a lot in space sustainability. And I don't think I've been screamed at by members more on any issue than on space sustainability, um, in part because of the different needs of different actors. So you've got the proliferated LEO constellations, the GEO operators, and then the CubeSat operators that have very different technical requirements and goals. Um, and in space sustainability discussions, you also have to realize um, the competitive issues at play, uh, you know, when we're talking about it. Um, some of our members are in lawsuits against other of our members. And then even though it, uh, the issues are not directly related to space sustainability, they will use space sustainability to try and hit, effectively hit the other uh, member pretty hard. It's, it's pretty painful. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, bringing in um, technical experts has usually helped on that front um, because I mostly interface day to day with our member companies' lawyers. I come from a technical background, um, so I do understand the orbital debris problem maybe a little better than some of our member companies' lawyers. Um, but having sort of a uh, rational third party that can back up the statements um, has helped, or even on other issues, bringing in um, you know outside experts has also helped. Um, and I'll say that of the members that have directly screamed at me and I think um, don't exhibit good professionalism, it has come back to bite them. Like one of them is trying to angle for a job in the Biden administration right now. Um, but there are enough people that don't like this person that I don't think um, she's going to get a job. So if you're a really, really terrible to other people, it will come back to bite you. Keeping it real. That's that's one of the realest things said. Yeah, that's that's what happens with professionalism and being unprofessional. Um, so for the next question, I want to actually start with you again and then you know roll up. Um, so many of you have mentored new students and young professionals through programs like SGAC and the Z Factor Fellowship. Can you share what you're looking for beyond like GPA and when you're trying to um, mentor somebody or consider them for a position and not just that too i want to combine like the other question i had what soft skills do you think are really important and i know we've touched on that um throughout this panel but okay yeah can you what do you look for um when you're trying to mentor or bring new students into your organization yeah um great question and um i understand uh you know having come up through the space industry not really knowing about the breadth of space industry jobs myself that a lot of people you know find out about this through happenstance or sort of late in their educational careers. Mm -hmm. um, so don't necessarily look for direct experience related to space. Um, do want to know that you're passionate about something in the space industry, um, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that just really comes through and that you ask good questions, like it, you understand um, the mission of whatever organization you wanna be part of. Um, so, for instance, I had a PhD student at one point um, want me to refer him to my former company. And he thought that we had like research labs on site and we're doing like technology demonstrations on site, which, and we were only a policy organization, like nothing physical, no hardware involved. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, you didn't even look at our website, did you? Because this all would have been there. Um, so not a great first impression. <laughs> um, Definitely looking at the um, ability to write and communicate. Um, uh, so we have our students, uh, well, within SIA, um, we have our students do a lot of writing um, and do a lot of presentations. Um, and you know, just be able to understand different stakeholders' points of view. Um, for something like the fellowship, um, also, oh, look for leadership capabilities. Um, so want to, you know, see qualities that I think is going to make you a leader in the space industry in the future and um, hopefully help others out with you. So I would say those are probably the major qualities that I look for. Thanks. Thanks. For, thanks for sharing that. So for everyone watching now or who will be watching in the future, yeah, it's communications and leadership are big themes that we've been hearing throughout this panel. Um, Rosanna, how about you? Um, what do you look for 
I know um, as part of ECSL, when trying to mentor people or bring people into the organization. Yes, I mean, I, I, um, I heard that we have some international or let's say European students here as well listening or, or maybe in the future, especially with the European Center of Space Law, a lot of the programs we do are, are only for students um, from, from member states. But, um, but I mean, we are having, I think we have quite a few listeners from, from, from there as well. So, so maybe this will help. Um, and this will help, of course, <laughs> beyond that as well. But the ECSL has a lot of workshops and courses where we sadly cannot accept everyone applying. You know, 100 applications come in and we can only take a handful. So what do we look at then? Of course, as, as mentioned before, the general prerequisites, you know, many of your colleagues will have the same. They will also be studying law. They might even have a specialization in international law. Um, maybe they've done a little course in space law. So that um, that will maybe not, not, you know, be enough. So you should, if possible, show your passion beyond that as well. Therese already mentioned a lot of a lot of examples, um, you know, research skills or writing skills, communication, um, being able to to speak in front of people. But just and also here again, it doesn't necessarily have to be within space law or space policy, because there isn't much you can do maybe in that field. Let's say right at the beginning of your studies. Mm -hmm. This often comes a bit later. But just um, just having shown through your CV that you're that you're passionate for what you do by um, by having been taking part in in competitions and workshops, even already starting writing research papers the moment you have a chance. There are so many opportunities for young professionals, um, essay competitions, etc. And and if you have this on your CV and you show that you you actively go beyond just going to law school, for example, uh, I think that goes a really long way. And those are then the CVs that get put aside and then um, get, get, get taken. Great, great points, great insight. I think it's super important because a lot of people don't realize, I mean, or they may realize space law is so niche. It's like, how do you, and like you said, like most people who find out are in the later part of their career. So how do you do it? And writing papers is a great example and even essay competitions, you don't have to win the essay competition. Just put yourself out there, though. Like this is, and that's extra ways of showing your passion. Because I'm um, imagine a lot of people are passionate about space. You hear space, you know, at least on the spectrum, you're a little bit passionate about it. But great points. Um, and, Maybe you know, if I, I may just, if I may just, sorry for to interrupt no, you, no but I just remembered, and Therese also said it, and I just got this example, um, the website uh, example. Um, you cannot believe how often I've I've had requests from students or, or questions asked where it's just clearly, clearly stipulated on the website what the ECSL is or what ESA is, for example. And and um, having done just the 10 minute research on your own, um, that's all you need to do. Read the website for 10 minutes. And this also is, is really important for any interview you'll have in the future, for any job interview. Just do a bit of research beforehand and that will go such a long way um, because believe me, your future employer or probably then maybe not employer will remember if you, if you uh, do not even know what the company is or what the organization is doing. But sorry, that was just something no, <laughs> that, 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 that I've a lot. Yeah, I bet it does. It harkens to your point about being prepared too. Like, and you're not, you don't have to be full on prepared. Literally just 10 minutes of preparation will go a long way. Thanks. Thanks for adding that. Um, Antonina, what about you? What do you think? What do you look for? I know you're, you're doing your, your postdoctoral research. You're in a lot of organizations. You have a lot of positions. What do you look for when bringing people onto them or trying to mentor somebody? What's, what skills, soft skills, things beyond the GPA? It's a very difficult question, uh, honestly, and, and it is for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because when, when, I, when I have to answer this question, I, I always have the fear that I'm biased, right? Because we tend to look in people what we think it's important, what we think we like of, of ourselves as well. And so there is a huge bias because one of the things I will answer you is that I, I always look for people who are proactive because I am proactive. And I think proactiveness is a great quality. It brings you uh, far and it shows people that you're motivated that you are in into into the mindset of taking action so whenever i'm looking for somebody whether I, whether it is somebody that i have to mentor or especially a colleague that i have to work with um i i always prefer people who are more proactive than people who are more 
you know into the silent uh, type of uh, type of personality but at the same time I, I i really think about this a lot is this kind of sort of a discrimination towards different type of personalities that can also have something to bring right and i'll tell you because um here as part of my responsibilities in luxembourg i coach them the mood court uh, team for the man for Luxembourg, rosanna <laughs> knows very well and um and for instance this year we have we have selected students who are a little bit more silent than the usual type that we get but it's not that they work any less than the others, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that they are a little bit more shy, the fact that they have, and this is in anticipation of what you will see, Rosanna, in the in the oral rounds, depending on the job we manage to do. In any event, you know, it's uh, not necessarily something that should prevent the selection of somebody, right? So I will tell you that these are important qualities. What was being mentioned before, of course, being prepared, uh, it's fundamental because it shows that you're professional and that you are committing to, um, to something. But... I would say also just to, to the people who are, who are thinking about having a career in space, just really be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. And if, if you keep not being selected because maybe some people have a problem with who you are, then that's not an argument for changing it, right? It's an argument for just finding the right fit because most of the times it is also about that. There are organizations who favor certain type of people and organizations who prefer others. Um, so really play your strength. That is certainly something that would be my advice at the end of the day because people who are evaluating uh, CVs and letter of interest for, for positions don't have a lot of time um, and they need to be impressed by something, right? And so just be focused on whatever are your strengths, whatever makes you different than others and the contributions you can give to a position or to an organization. Most of the times you read people saying, I do this, I am this, I am that, but what can you do for me, right? What can you do for the organization, for the position? How, what are you going to bring? Tell me this, and therefore I can decide whether or not I want to work with you, because at the end of the day, it's um, it's about that. Thanks, that's great. You hit a lot of a lot of points, actually, um, playing onto your strengths and like, for people listening, because I know people, some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. This isn't just meant for people think like, oh, the space is flashy, it's an, like an extrovert thing. You don't have to, you could be an introvert, you, you know, you just play to your strengths. Um, a real good point. So I just want to ask one real last question and hopefully you can just touch on this quick um, before we play our video for Rue. I just wanted to say, and I guess I'll start with you, Rosanna. What do you think professionals should expect or um, from others including their employers and organizations? What should we expect in terms of professionalism? So what, what we should expect from our employers, professionally speaking? Mm -hmm. Did I get the question correctly? All right. Exactly, yeah, bingo. Um, well, I think especially at the beginning of your career, and 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 I, I do this myself, I expect from them that, that they help me learn. Um, <laughs> That's, that's really what the beginning is. That's what doing an internship is all about. That's what doing a traineeship should be about is really having the possibility to learn and not just learn in one specific area, um, but, but learn from, from, from all of your colleagues or, 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 or yes, colleagues at work, especially. Uh, let's say you have a colleague who's specialized in export control. Um, maybe not something that's very space law niche but you know, learn from, from, from that knowledge there as well. Or you have a colleague that does only arbitration. Um, these are things that are gonna help you in the future as well. Um, space law goes beyond five UN treaties, as you know. Um, and, and I think this is something that's really, really important. And if you do not have the feeling that you, you, you're getting this opportunity from your employer, from an organization where you're, you're doing an internship, then communicate it. I mean, communication has been mentioned, I think, I don't know, 10 times now, <laughs> but that's a fact. You need to communicate it because you need to just say, I would like to learn more. Is there anything else I can do to learn more? And, and I think this is something that, that, that uh, professionalism is also, uh, especially from an organization point of view or employer point of view is, um, or mentorship programs is the whole point is teaching and, uh, and that's what it should be. But um I believe that um, is this is this the last question that I would also uh, like to just uh, mention maybe one tip that I got and um, and I thought it was so refreshing what what Antonino said about uh, being impulsive and that and that he's he's working on that and, and I have things also 
first impulsiveness and and um, and also taking things way too personally or I used to and this is something that I've been working on for years um, and I think that is also something that you you should be working on namely on yourself never stop working on yourself both of course privately but we're talking about a professional context now because you can always be um, more professional um, yes so Thank you, thank you. Um, Therese, Anthony, would you like to add to that? Because so, it was a bonus question, so don't feel like don't feel like you have to. Sure, um, agree with everything that was just said. Um, I think you know the ability to develop new skills professionally um, is something that's really important, and hopefully you can find an internship. Um, abilities to you know connect with other people in the space industry um, should hopefully also be provided. Um, in your internship and, you know, just learn more about the different career trajectories, um, both at your company and elsewhere. Um, and then I think, you know, getting constructive feedback um, is also something that's really important and being able to, if you're, if there's no structured way for you to get feedback, um, at least being able to ask your boss, hey, can we meet, you know, with X frequency to go over my performance and any tips you have on improvement. Because if you just sit there for an entire summer or semester um, doing work and you don't get any sort of feedback, it's not really helpful for you. That is huge. You, you are all dropping gems here. Um, Antonino, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Well, there, there's really not much to add. I think Rosanne and Therese explained everything beautifully. Uh, what I could say is that what I personally like in an employer is clarity. Uh, clarity of relationship, right? What are my boundaries? What is expected from me? What do I have to do? How do you help me doing it? You know, and what are the ways in which I am assessed? And this kind of thing. I think clarity is, is, is important. It's too important because if I don't know what is expected of me, if I don't know how to interact with my employer, what are the boundaries that I need to follow? And everyone, everybody has different ones, right? So it's important, I think, to clarify this kind of thing from the very beginning, you know, like, okay, we're going to do this together in this position for this kind of amount of time. Uh, how are we going to work together? You know, put everything down. I think if you do it from the from the very beginning, then your relationship will be so much better because you you put everything uh, behind you already and you know how to behave. If if you just don't do it, then it will come to the point that there's going to be a misunderstanding because we're human beings and that happens. And then you will not know how to solve it. And they, this is where things go wrong, where things can escalate. And then uh, and then when you can lose your job or you know make it so much worse, right? So it is, I think, important to clarify. And sometimes employers don't do that because to a certain extent ambiguity goes in favor of who has the power in the relationship right so they don't need to clarify it because in any case they they have control over you they have control of your position but it's it's a your right i think it's your it's in your interest and it's your right to to ask for that to ask for clear boundaries for clear terms of of professional relationships so that then you can owe to them and you can abide to them and whatever happens you always have an objective reference that was agreed beforehand that will make uh, things much easier to to process and to and to address. Uh, before, be, because we are concluding, I, and we mentioned today uh, many times the Eagle team. I also have an Eagle here that I, that I actually wanted to show because I bought this uh, in celebration of, of the wonderful time I had with the Eagle team. I have a little bit of a plaque here. But I want to say hi to to all the members of that team, and I want to use that as an example. You know, this this leading that team has been one of the best experiences of my of my life, honestly. And, and it all started because I, I wanted to have the young generation expressing a position on, on lunar governance. And SGC has been uh, kind enough to give me the opportunity to work on that. And, and then I met wonderful people like Nikli and the others. So don't, don't think that because something is not happening, it cannot happen in the future. You can make it happen. And so if you think that something has to be done and nobody's done it before, just uh, show initiative. Um, going back to my previous point, because sometimes that's what makes a difference and it goes into all the different places. So um, just be yourself. But if you think that something is missing, don't be intimidated by the fact that the system is not giving you an opportunity because sometimes you can, you can bend the system and, and make it happen. So good luck with your endeavors. I'm sure that all the people who work at the Space Corps Foundation will have a wonderful career. So uh, very, very happy for them. Hey, that said, thank you, Antonina, Rosanna, and Therese. Wonderful panel. Um, yeah, even I learned a lot from it. I, like, I really appreciate it. Um, Nathan, um, do we have time for, for Rue's video? Rue's video? Or? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so after you.
Hi everyone, my name is Rubimbo Samanga and I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm a space lawyer operating in the African space industry as well as the global space industry in both GIS policy, satellite communications policy and a little bit of lunar development policy as well. I thrive myself on being a space advocate and I'm involved in a number of initiatives all around the world and currently I'm attending the first GMES uh, and Africa Forum being held in Ivory Coast, Abidjan. So I cannot be there with you all today, but I look forward to sharing my insights with you and I wish you a wonderful journey. I'd like to share with you today my personal perspective on professionalism, which has come from a lot of trial and error, but a lot of earnest desire to discover not only myself, but my place in this very vibrant industry. I think that professionalism means maintaining a high standard of integrity and discipline towards your work. But this doesn't mean you don't have a personality outside of work. It simply means that you find that perfect work-life balance that brings meaning to all the different aspects of your persona. I'd like to share moments in which I've had to balance these different interests, not only my own interests, but with other individuals in a melting uh, cultural pot, as I would call it. And I think it's important to understand when you work in an international sphere that you encounter people from all different walks of life. And it's always important to highlight what each person's strengths and weaknesses are in order for us to cross collaborate and sort of share the weight accordingly to that end. I think it's important when you're expanding on professionalism to really hone in on what your strengths are and see how you can contribute to the group in a meaningful and productive way, and also to be tolerant of other people's weaknesses. My tips, I suppose, that I've heard as I navigated this interesting journey would be developing what I have heard Jeff Bezos refer to as intellectual humility. And what this means is that you do not know everything. So you have to leave room or an open mind to learn more and discover more, and you will most certainly do this through other people. Networking is so important. You never know when you will meet the next person in a different environment and require either their help or their expertise. So it's always important to treat everyone you meet with kindness and respect. And I think above all, I think when engaging with people in the industry that have divergent views, always come with a listening ear always come with the intention to understand people's viewpoints and always come with an intention to reach a middle ground. I'll give the example of one of the most seminal issues of our time, which is the issue of space debris or space traffic management in low Earth orbit. If all stakeholders understood that this is a matter that will affect us all, sustainability initiatives would be much more coordinated and much more earnest in a desire to bring about interoperability as opposed to competition. We could much rather protect the lower Earth orbit if all stakeholders came together and agreed to share capabilities, use the same technologies, allow each other to share different spectrum platform and satellite tech opportunities, and allow us to thus preserve that area of outer space as you know, a very useful factor for bringing about sustainable development. So rather than let market forces lead this new terrain, it's important we think of what humanity ascribes to this area of outer space. And to that end, thinking together, collaborating together, and sharing skills and resources will always be the most important factor of this industry. When I look at individuals to mentor or to engage with, I always look for self-starters. These are individuals who are self-motivated and willing to carve out their own path. You may get tempted to follow the path of another and it's very easy to do so, but at the end of the day, we each have very unique and specific talents that we deserve to exploit. So I often look for those individuals who have a sharp idea of where they want to go and sort of need that extra little push. The advice I can give you today is, first of all, to shoot for the stars. And this is not just a rhetoric saying, but this is an industry that has so many opportunities. And of course, you do have to go after them. 
but don't for any minute feel bad for achieving everything you have achieved and for going after everything you've ever wanted. If space has taught us anything is that it's a magnanimous terrain with so much room to grow and so much potential. The next advice I can give you is to treat everyone with kindness and respect and understand that space is the province of all humankind, which means that humanness is at the core of everything we do. So always strive to make meaningful connections with individuals and don't get caught up in using people to sort of make it to the next rung on the ladder of your career, but actually forge friendships that you can rely on for years to come. And last but not least, have fun. It's very easy to get caught up in the career swing of things, but it's so important for you to cultivate all the aspects of your life, focus on your career interests, but also focus on your personal interests, your family, and also everything else in between that makes you tick. Remember to have fun and be yourself. You can never go wrong when you're passionate about what you do and you do it authentically. I really wish you all the best in your journey. And as always, I'm on hand to help you with any questions that you might have. And I wish you a successful internship period. Thank you so much to the Space Court Foundation for giving me this platform. Thank you very much to all of our panelists, uh, to Ruben Bosamanga for uh, sharing that video with us. Um, also to uh, Antonino Salmeri, Rosanna Hoffman, Therese Jones. Uh, if anybody has any questions about their organizations uh, that they mentioned, the SGAC, the Z Factor Fellowship, or the ECSL, please let us know. And I'd also like to thank the moderator, Mac Lee Carroll, again, our Deputy Executive Director here at the Space Court Foundation. And now I'd like to turn to the final portion of today's orientation, a very special interview with our special guest, Audrey Powers who we have celebrated on the Space Court Foundation social media channels uh, as the first space lawyer to have gone into space. Um, we have not been fact-checked, corrected uh, on that. Um, so Audrey, as far as we know, that is a true distinction that you have. Um, and we can get into that uh, in a moment, but I'm gonna go ahead and read your uh, official bio here. Audrey Powers is the Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations for Blue Origin, where she is responsible for New Shepard flight operations and training, vehicle maintenance, and launch complex infrastructure at Launch Site 1. Audrey is also an astronaut, having flown on the second human flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard program, NS-18. Previously, Audrey served as Vice President of Legal and Compliance for Blue Origin, overseeing a wide variety of legal matters, including regulatory affairs, legislative and policy matters, supplier and customer negotiations, and management, maritime law, crisis response, and legal operations. Uh, Audrey received a bachelor's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue University in 1999 and worked as an engineer for almost 10 years prior to becoming a lawyer. As a guidance and controls engineer, she was a flight controller for NASA with 2,000 hours of console time and mission control for the International Space Station program. After leaving NASA, she supported government satellite programs for Lockheed Martin and received a Juris Doctor in 2008 from Santa Clara University School of Law. Audrey, thank you for joining us today. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you uh, on our internship program. Um, Thanks, but, Nathan. It's uh, great to see you again. Been a it's while. Great to see you. Um, <laughs> Chris, I haven't Chris seen you in here somewhere too. I think <laughs> I saw his name go by. <laughs> yes, um, I haven't seen you since you've uh, been into space. So my first question for you: um, What is space like? Well, um, it is as amazing as you would hope it would be, and probably a hundred times more. Um, if, if anyone uh, attending had the, um, had the ability to, to watch the coverage of the launch, um, I, I flew with um, a collection of gentlemen, one of them, William Shatner, and 
thank goodness, because he was very eloquent when we all stepped out of the capsule and three of us were struggling to find words to explain what we had just experienced. And he was very, um, he was very eloquent in, um, and, and one of the things he said has really, really stuck with me. And that is, I hope I never recover from this. And, um, the, the perspective that uh, we got, I think, was more than we hoped going into it. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot of astronauts speak about the overview effect and seeing the planet from that perspective. And it really, it really was um, just something that is hard to describe, particularly for people who have had um, space aspirations and, and dreams uh, as part of their life for for decades, um, so it it really was um, it really was life changing uh, for for me and and for the the three gentlemen that I that I flew with. So um, just an extraordinary experience. I, I mean, I I don't know how many lawyers interested in space law do it because they want to use it as an excuse to go into space. Um, but I mean, I'm certain that, you know, all of us in the profession are, you know, so proud of your accomplishment in that regard and being a, and becoming an astronaut. But, um, you know, there is so much in your career that um, is there to look up to uh, for, for current students and, and young professionals. Um, so I want to. I just want to take a step back because you know I, I yeah. read your bio. Um, in your first career wasn't as a lawyer; it was as an engineer. And so I just wanted right. to ask, you know, all the way back at the beginning, how did you get interested in space? Well, I I think I I am a, a very lucky person in that I think I can blame my parents for that. I, um, I was very interested as a child in flying things. Um, and I also very much, um, at, a, at, a, at a very early age, um, liked math. <laughs> and my parents, um, my parents are liberal arts types. My, my father was a lawyer for decades. Um, my mother was a, was a linguist and a teacher. And, um, they, they, uh, I, I guess maybe a little bit famously now have said, we don't know how we ended up with this child that was so interested in science and, and math. And I was really, really interested in flying things. And I grew up in the DC area and my parents would take us to the Smithsonian museums. And I just, I always wanted to go to the Air and Space Museum. Um, and we had relatives that lived in North Carolina near where the Wright Brothers Museum is. And I can remember going to that. So there, there are these things as a child that I remember just um, pestering my parents to um, be around more flying things. And um, when I when I first took note of the of the space shuttle and started watching some of that coverage um, with my parents of astronauts on orbit doing various things with the space shuttle, um, I was I was just absolutely enamored with um, that kind of exploration. And I think my my parents were people who are very, very curious about just all areas of, of learning and life. And they, they definitely gave me and my, my brother and sisters this kind of, um, this kind of very basic interest in, in understanding any, any number of, of topics. And I really, um, exploration for me was one that um, was always just very, very, very intriguing. Um, and then the, the ability that I learned that people had to explore um, space and, and off the planet through, whether it was astronomy or um, through space flight were things that just really, really um, interest me as a child. And my, my parents looked for opportunities for me to get exposure to those, to those things. So completely, completely their fault. Well, well, we, we thank them. We thank them for their error. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that, that space in general, and, and you said, uh, you know, uh, strong in mathematics and being able to parlay that mm -hmm. into to engineering. Um, but then talk to us about this next step, about going from mm -hmm. engineering into law. 
Did you know when you were going into law school that you wanted to stay in the space industry? Mm-hmm. Was there a specific goal you had in mind or were you just interested in the field? Yeah, this is um, something that I speak with students a lot about because I, I think there are so many opportunities for um, people who are students and people who are professionals who might be interested in exploring a different aspect of, of their um, career field. Uh, it kind of this this change that I that I made from engineering and, and law and um, so when I when I left I left NASA for um, for for family reasons and and moved from Texas to the Bay Area and I th- I thought when I when I got my first job at, at NASA on the space station program I thought I would be there for my entire career I mean that was that all I ever wanted to do was work for NASA that was um, very much where I saw myself um, living out my career um, and so I had some some uh, family reasons some personal reasons that I had to leave uh, Houston. And moved to the Bay Area, and and so I was looking at the the various space companies there, and um, ended up going to work for Lockheed Martin on these on these government satellite programs. Very very interesting and, and challenging work in, in its own right. But I tell you, when when human spaceflight on the space station program is your first job coming out of college, you know, twenty three years old, I'm sitting on console. And it was it was at the very beginning of space station construction. I mean, this was 25 years ago almost. And I mean, the, we had one element of the space station on the orbit uh, on orbit. And by the time I left, we had activated the U.S. lab. We had we had installed multiple solar array, and and it was just such an exciting time to be at NASA, and and such an such an active and challenging time to be. Um, to be at NASA, that going to anything any other job after that was kind of, oh, well, this isn't as exciting <laughs> as, as human space flight and constructing the, the space station on orbit. So, um, so I said, well, what, you know, is this, is this going to be it? Am I now going to just go, you know, work on satellite programs and, and is kind of what, what am I going to do now? And there were a lot of other fields that I was interested in, probably hearkening back to my parents being interested in, in any number of things. I said, well, um, you know, I could go get an MBA. There were a lot of joint engineering MBA type programs. I could go get my master's in engineering or maybe a PhD in engineering because I, I really I really did love engineering. Um, and my father um, had been a lawyer for decades. And I, I mean, literally the, the discussions that we had around the dinner table when I was a child was about Fourth Amendment searches and seizures. You know, like this was, that was how I grew up as a child. So I had the law around me a lot. And it was when and my mother was a linguist. Maybe I'll go and study some international, you know, some language or international policy I was very interested in. So I just had all of these things that I knew I wanted to study something else and get a higher level degree. And I kind of didn't know which of these to choose. And I very much felt like if I make the wrong choice here, I'm going to pay for it because I'm going to be miserable in my career. And so I I felt a really, a really, really um, heavy sense of responsibility to myself to, to make the right choice. And I ended up choosing law school because in the, in, in Silicon Valley, where I was, and particularly at Santa Clara, there were tons of engineers going to law school, particularly at Santa Clara, to become patent lawyers. It's one of the best patent law schools in the in the country. Um, and so there were all of these similarly situated professionals like me, who you know, I'd been working eight or 10 years by that point. Um, so kind of like had, had reached a, a little bit of a plateau in their engineering career, wanted to um, broaden their, their um, view of, of things. And so I found that there were people very much like me when I looked into this law this law school program at, at Santa Clara. Um, I and and so it, that that gave me a lot of comfort that there were people thinking about making the same sort of change that that I was making. Um, and and I loved law school. I absolutely loved it. As as difficult as it was, I was working full time at Lockheed, going to school at night, and that that schedule is not something that I direct. I mean, you gotta, you gotta really uh, like be dedicated to, you gotta really want a law degree to, to, uh, to go through that schedule. Um, but I absolutely loved law school. It was like turning on a side of my brain that had been off for, for some period of time with, you know, getting back to writing, um, and that, that, um, 
kind of uh, analytical presentation of a, of a case um, was, is just a little bit different than, than what I was dealing with in engineering. So I, I, I really thought hard about that change. And I, I did a lot of um, research into the school and met um, some of the professors there before I decided to, to um, start that program. Um, and it really ended up being a very fulfilling um, choice a choice for me, but I, I absolutely said, I want to stay in the space industry. I want to stay working with high technology companies. Um, as a lawyer, it was, it was very much what I wanted to do. I, I didn't know if I wanted to do patent law. Um, and so I did, I studied a lot of administrative law when I was in, um, when I was in law school, I studied, uh, abroad in Geneva in an international, um, public law program. Um, and that uh, those were two things that I was very, very interested in, kind of the, the government and the public international law aspects of it. Um, so I ended up, I, th I think, as you know, um, being more, a bit more focused on, on regulatory affairs when I, when I first came out of, of law school. So didn't, didn't end up going the patent route, but um, it, was, it was really fun to, to be able to stay in kind of my chosen engineering um, industry as a, as a lawyer. So I, I very much had that intention. I mean, that, that's so exciting to hear, um, you know, as a, a regulatory attorney myself, I think it's a great choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I've enjoyed it. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's certainly uh, different backgrounds can help when entering the law. Um, mm -hmm. It makes sense. And I'm so glad that you found a community of students who also had that engineering background and that same career step. Um, I wish I had found other students who were coming from a screenwriting career and trying to enter law school. Mm -hmm. That was a little different. Um, but, um, you know, you, you said you wanted make, to say- You make such a great point, Nathan, that, that the law really is so accessible from so many backgrounds. It really, really, it, it just, it transfers from so many, from so many backgrounds. And I think it really is, it, it's, it's such a rich experience to have a, a bit of a career in another um, in another field before you you get into law um, that it really you know I, I I feel like I took a bit of a circuitous path to get to where I am but I, I I really am so glad that that I did and I think you 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 are evidence also that um, that it, the law is really accessible to a lot of different types of people thank you yeah and I and I think that as a group and as a field, we benefit from having people from yeah. different backgrounds as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Just that diversity is absolutely true. Yep. Um, so, you know, you said you wanted to stay in the space industry. Um, did you, did you at any point think that you were putting together a career path to become an astronaut? Or is no. it one of those black swan <laughs> type situations not. where you it, yeah. like, look backwards and you're like, oh, I happenstance put together all these pieces that led yeah. to becoming an astronaut. Absolutely. Um, I, I, when I was young, very much had aspirations of being an astronaut. When I worked at NASA and, um, you know, was, was working every day with astronauts and astronauts were my next door neighbors in Houston, you know, like astronauts became so accessible to me. And I, I realized in some ways how normal they are, to, you know, like dealing with their kids and their families, and, you know, and going to the grocery store and, and normal things like all of us do. And then in some ways, they're so not normal too. They have these amazing backgrounds or they're decorated military pilots or whatever, whatever the situation might be. And after I, after I left um, NASA and went to Lockheed, I, 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 you know, I didn't necessarily lose my dream of being an astronaut, but I think at some point I reached an age, you know, in the, maybe in the last 10 years or so that I said, you know, that's probably not happening for me. Like NASA was still, the idea of the NASA astronaut was still, um, you have to work your entire life and then you have to become a professional astronaut. And that has to be what you do day in and day out. That was still the model of the astronaut that I had in mind. And I think I reached an age where I said, you know, I'm probably not going to do that. You know, early forties, I'm probably getting out of the age where I'm going to switch to becoming a full-time professional astronaut, even if, if NASA wanted me, which I'm not suggesting they ever did, but, um, 
So I don't uh, no, I absolutely did not um, think that I was putting together a career that someone would look at and say, that person should fly in space. She should be an astronaut. Um, I, I was very, very happy to support other people going and to work on programs that were enabling other people to explore um, and that I, I got to learn through their exploration. So it, 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 you know, at some point it became not as much about me exploring, but just helping the human race explore and, and figure out new, um, new means for, for the solar system and, and traveling through, through space. And, and when I got um, connected with Blue Origin um, about eight, eight years ago, um, it was really this idea of benefiting the earth what just so resounded with me a great deal. And I think I've become more sensitive and aware as I have um, gotten older too, that, um, that, you know, the, the planet really has finite resources and we need to pay attention to that. And we need to, to um, put a lot of our energy into figuring out what we're going to do to protect those resources. Um, and so that aspect of Blue Origins mission really resonated with me um, when, when, when I was a lawyer. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely was, was happy to join a company that was really looking to expand space access for all sorts of people. I didn't I still didn't think that that person would be me. I, I had absolutely no expectation ever uh, um, that I would be be flying to space um, for for Blue Origin. So I was just happy to support other people doing it. It's just it's just part of the job, right? I Going well, to space. I it's it's not it's actually not. <laughs> I, um, I, you know, oddly, we had um, and 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 people have asked me about this, so. It, if you'll indulge me there, uh, nobody joins Blue Origin. Um, we do not hire astronauts. We, do, we don't hire people for the purpose of flying them to space. We have former astronauts on our staff doing things like human integration and, and some of our flight directors are former NASA astronauts. So um, we, we definitely like bring that knowledge in um, to, to inform our, our human space flight programs, but we do not hire anyone for the purpose of flying to space. Um, it's, it's kind of not our it's not our mission, you know, or our goal. And, and a lot of people, I, th I thought maybe a group of lawyers would be interested in, I've, I've been asked a couple of times, well, do you consider yourself a real astronaut? You know, like what is the definition, what is the legal definition of astronaut? And, and um, you know, I, I think what I've learned through this experience is there are, um, I, you know, I as well had this image of what an astronaut is, and it was this professional, you know, NASA um, uh, model. And I, I have met so many people through this experience who um, don't want to go live on a space station for years at a time. They don't want to take two years to travel to Mars. They don't even want to go up on a space shuttle for two weeks and live on orbit but they would love to get a taste of what space is. They would love it. They still have like that, that exploration, uh, you know, dream, but they don't want to do those longer duration things. And they would absolutely love it if they could get uh, on a, on a vehicle like New Shepard and for 15 minutes, see what space is and get that perspective of the planet um, and experience what I was lucky enough to experience. And so I, I think what, what we commercial companies are, are doing now is enabling a different type of space flight to a much larger um, population of people. And I think we can absolutely call them astronauts too. Um, they have the same curiosity, <laughs> you know, that, that others, that the long duration space flyers do. And um, so I, I definitely, you know, I, I, I'm maybe more... Um, maybe more expansive in my view of what the definition of an astronaut is. But, um, you know, I think I've shown all my colleagues at Blue Origin too, that I'm going to be the biggest advocate to keep flying. You know, everybody at Blue Origin should get to fly on New Shepard. <laughs> and, and everybody, like all the lawyers I know, all the engineers I know, they should get to fly in their vehicles. So um, I'm, I'm becoming our biggest advocate for sure. <laughs> No, I mean that that's that's exciting. That's why it's great to have um, 
role, mo role models like yourself who are also um, bringing others along with you, right? And growing, <laughs> growing the community and growing the experience and sharing that experience um, with as many people as possible. So we thank you for that, that example. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanna transition now and, and talk about um, you know, the field of, of space law as, as a whole. And, you know, uh, when students or young professionals are looking at space law and they're thinking about, you know, what are the issues that are ongoing in space law? What would the things that companies or governments need to have tackled, you know, what is currently happening in space law that is providing those opportunities for lawyers yeah. to work? Well, this is a really interesting topic for me because when I when I graduated from law school, um, I guess thirteen years ago now or so, um, you know, people looked at me and and I think said, "Oh, she's a space lawyer," because I had had a career in the in the space industry and then I became a lawyer and I was working my my first um, my first law job out of law school was, was with Francesca Schroeder, who, who I know a number of us know very well. Um, and she had a practice where she, you know, she represented all sorts of space industry clients. And I said, well, I, I guess, you know, you can call me a space lawyer. I, I, I work with Francesca with these many clients in, in this industry, but it, we were doing work that could be done for any high tech um, type company, right? We were doing export controls. We were doing government contracts and, co and commercial contracts. Um, and there was very little at that time that was so uniquely space law. Um, Francesca um, has been part of UN Copious um, efforts and so had been in the international space policy and space law community and dealt with a lot of those um, you, you know, the, the, the larger treaty type discussions that were occurring among governments. But day to day working in the space industry back to e even just 10 or 15 years ago, that was not front and center. What we were, we were not debating the outer space treaty every day or like looking for practical applications of article six and all of these things. Like it just wasn't present. It, we were dealing with things that all technology companies worked with. And certainly there were, there were unique aspects of, um, you know, contractual mechanisms that satellite um, manufacturers and launchers use when they were going to go. And, and there were, I mean, there were, there were interesting nuances that the space industry used that were somewhat different than other industries, but it really wasn't until probably you know, eight, eight years ago when I joined Blue was when I really saw a change in the industry that more people, more companies are looking at these commercial launch vehicles, commercial applications in space. They're demanding of this FAA structure that had been built, you know, decades ago, but that had never been practiced. We were really looking to start exercising those FAA regulations and the Commercial Space Launch Act. Um, and NASA particularly was starting to look at, um, you know, things like authorities that came through the, um, the Outer Space Treaty and how is this going to work among nations when we start getting these private actors into space. And it was really the first time. So I used to tell law students, you know, early in my, my legal career, I used to tell law students, you need to be really, really good at all of the generic things that lawyers are good at. So contracts, administrative law, if you want to, if you want to work with the government, um, you know, at advo appellate advocacy, if you want to represent big high tech companies that might get into litigation. So you just have to be good at those basic legal skills, negotiations, and, and it, there wasn't so much nuanced about space law back then. That has really, really changed in the last five years. In the last five years, it, is very, it has been very easy for me to say, this is, this is what a space lawyer does. And that, that label actually really, really means something because my life, while, while it, you know, that long list of things that you wrote, those are all things that at some point at Blue Origin, I was neck deep in, in those things. But it became, 
much more clear the longer I was at Blue that dealing with the FAA and getting an FAA license or dealing with Congress on the next iterations of the amendments to the Commercial Space Launch Act, that could be my full-time job. Like there is enough work dealing with the FCC on how are we going to license Spectrum on the moon? Um, how are we going to comply with our Article 6 requirements for continuing supervision and, and things like that? And once you get all these commercial actors in space, who in the U.S. government is going to run those licensing regimes? That kind of stuff became my full-time job. And it was like, this is finally... and and. I had colleagues at other at other company, Karen Shenowork at, at SpaceX and now at, at Relativity. And, and I know you all have, have spoken with um, Sabrina at the FAA. And, um, you know, these these lawyers that I, I kind of, you know, kind of came into the industry at the same time, we all really, really had space, nuanced space stuff to focus on. Um, which I think is really is is really great, but it it doesn't change my initial premise that some of these very very basic legal skills, negotiating contracts, advocating for your position, public speaking, all of those things are so so important <laughs> to be successful in any of these. Um, understanding how the government works, you know, basic civics. <laughs> how does I, I know Chris loves this one? Like, how does Congress work? And what? <laughs> um, so those are those are all really things that just provide you a great foundation for, um, it, you know, a, a practice in space law, which I think now is, is a very, very vibrant thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense when you said, you know, your, your experience with Francesca Schroeder, because I think she gave me my favorite piece of advice that I quote to students, which is, if you're looking for a job in space law, first work on a business discipline. Yeah. Because Every space company is a business and yep. they're going to need some support in that. And that's your foot in the door. Yep. Um, and She's so great. And it's, yeah. it's so true. It's yeah. so true. Um, we had a raised hand um, from our deputy executive director, Mackley Carroll. Mackley, did you uh, have a question? Um, yeah, it was more or less of a question. I don't even know how the raised hand thing came up. I just wanted to echo um, Audrey's points on negotiating contracts. And said it was a real great thing. And thank you for for being here as well. Yeah, it it is um, something that's been so fascinating in my as I transitioned out of the legal team at Blue now into my mission and flight operations role. Um, one of the last things I did as a lawyer was. Um, work with the team that was developing our human spaceflight contracts, right? So how are we going to fly the private citizens to space um, that, that, we, that we hope to, to fly there? And so what does a launch services contract look like with a human being? We have all of these models for satellite launch services contracts that have been used for decades in this industry, um, but, but how do we do that? And how do we build the informed consent process that the FAA requires? And how do we build the waivers that the FAA requires? And do those match from a business perspective the types of contractual provisions that Blue wants to enter into with these individuals. So there are a number of um, really, really interesting um, contractual issues that have kind of emerged in this in this era of, of flying um, private customers to to space. And this this has become so so important important just being able to draft and negotiate contracts um, in different but both at the at the business to business level and at the business to individual level yeah I mean there there's there's contracts there's domestic legislation and regulation um, and then of course as you said there's the, the international aspect of of space um, we had a, a question from one of the attendees um, they wanted to know more about the international public law program you attended in mm. Geneva. They actually asked about the name of it, but if you wanted to talk a brief moment about the intersection of international law with what you do as well. Yeah, well, at the at the time, I was um, I, I I knew about um, the the Outer Space Treaty when I was first getting into law school and the and the um, Committee for the Peaceful Use of Uses of Outer Space and and those types of things. I generally knew about them. Um, the, the public international law program that Santa Clara University has in their law school, um, you go to 
Geneva and Strasbourg, uh, France for, um, a portion of the summer after one of your, um, after one of your academic years. And it is an introduction to all things UN. So you meet the different UN bodies in Geneva, you meet um, a, a, a number of NGOs that are in and around um, Geneva that interact with the UN. So you really, you learn about the, the public, um, the public international law kind of infrastructure of these organizations and how they interact. Um, so it was a really good, it was, a, it was more general than just space. It was kind of all, you know, we met all different kinds of NGOs and, and multiple different um, bodies of the UN. So it was not at all just focused on space. It was just kind of a general introduction to that whole world, which was really helpful um, when I got to meet Francesca because I had, I had taken some um, administrative law courses at Santa Clara to get an introduction to, you know, rulemaking processes and things like that. So I had some clue about how things work on the national level. And I had some clue about how things work on the international level. And then, you know, meeting a, a person like Francesca and having her be my first, um, you know, boss and mentor in, in this field uh, was really great because I could see the work that she did at, at UN um, Copuas every every couple of years. Um, and then that was kind of expanded when I started meeting and working with people like Mike Gold, um, who ended up at, at NASA, but has also been in the private industry um, and has made such great strides for us, you know, in the, in the Artemis program and the work that he did on the Artemis Accords. I mean, really, one of the first practical applications of some of those pieces of, of the, the Outer Space Treaty. So there are concrete opportunities now to work with these, these international law frameworks that have just kind of been sitting there and that we all like to talk about in academic settings and, and at conferences. Um, there, I, think, I think Mike really brought to our work lives the practical application of those, of those things. Um, so yeah, that's a really big, the, the Artemis program, I'd like NASA and, and Mike, they, they should be commended for, um, really, really progressing the industry in that, in that way. And, and saying, we all have to figure out how we're going to use this international law structure that, that was created all these years ago. Like, what are we going to do with this? Um, so it just really fantastic work there. Yeah, no. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I know Mike Gold and, and obviously Chris, uh, you know, work with yeah. Mike Gold, and, and yeah. um, we've also had Francesca Schroeder as um, president uh, of the yeah. final round of the North American ISL Manfred Locks Moot Court competition. Yeah. Um, like two of the know, best. I mean, yeah. they're just two of the best in our industry. They are. Yeah, and it, you know, if you'll uh, forgive me a moment for plugging the Space Court Foundation, but you know, Not one of the the goals of the foundation was to sort of um, bring this international law framework, yeah. um, into a constructive environment where, um, we give students the opportunity while they're in law school to be able to look at these sort of big questions of the law, but the research program that we have is oriented to then breaking it down and making sure that, um, you know, it's contextualized into an operational environment about how it's actually applied. Yeah, uh, in day to day activities. Um, yep. And so and something, you know. something else that Mike that Mike Gold did when he was at NASA, um, the regulatory and policy committee, um, which was uh, which which was an, an offshoot of the NASA advisory council. Um, they had a number of, of different committees and one of them was the regulatory and policy committee. Mike Gold was the 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 NASA chair of that when he was at NASA. And he collected up a, up a bunch of us, um, like me and and Karen, uh, uh, Sharon, Karen Shanawerk, um, uh Mark Sandal, who I know you guys know well, um, Jeff Mamber from from Nanorax. So there were there were a bunch of us that interacted in the legal and, and policy world um, that were brought together on this regulatory and policy committee. And we looked at things like, uh, Jennifer Warren, another one from, from Lockheed, a, a fantastic career in this industry. Um, and, and we would get together and debate, you know, how should NASA be looking at these international frameworks and, and how should the NASA advisory council be considering things like this going into these larger international agreements like the Artemis Accords. Um, so that, that was another, 
um, really interesting place where a lot of this got debated and and um, we we put uh, we put forth a, num a number of recommendations to um, to the NASA Advisory Council when um, back when Mike was there. All right, I know that we're uh, now running over time, but I did have one last question. If you have oh, a moment, yeah. I'm just okay. going to combine the three questions I had in the outline into one, which is basically, what advice do you have? for students or young professionals that are looking at a career in space law? You know, one way I wrote it was, are there any misconceptions about how do you get to work for a company like Blue Origin? Is, is the path really that complex and obtuse? Um, or how do you just you know, get started with that goal in mind? Yeah, I, d I don't think that the the path needs to be as convoluted and obtuse as the one that I, as the one that I have taken. Um, I think there is always going there's always going to be a benefit to companies to your earlier point of people who have um, who are who are bringing some other experience to the table. So whether it's because you worked for a few years before going to law school in in some interesting field or if you have, I know there are a lot of JD MBA programs out there. Those are very, very attractive to, to companies to, to your other point of, of like being business, business smart and capable. Um, so people who, who come with experience are always going to be um, interesting. I, I think, so when I was in the legal team at, at Blue, we started with two of us. There was the general counsel and there was me. Um, and, and by the time I, I left the legal team, we had 20 um, people, lo lawyers and contracts um, folks. And we finally had reached the point where we could handle hiring new graduates fresh out of law school, um, people who had gone from their undergrad straight into law school and, and the only work experience that they had were internships or um, you know, summer programs. Uh, but it took a long time for us to get there. And I know that my colleagues at other companies um, in the space industry, we talked about this too, that um, it, it, there was a long time where we just needed experienced lawyers. We, we need lawyers with at least probably five to eight years of experience coming in um, to help these companies with, the, with, their, with their legal matters. Um, because we had heavily, heavily re relied on outside counsel. Um, you can imagine like small companies like, well, I don't need three full-time lawyers. I just need a lawyer who specializes in labor and employment law. And so I'm going to use a firm to do that until we reached a certain size. And then we said, okay, we've got enough labor and employment matters that we can hire a labor and employment lawyer. Um, so we were able to expand our, our team like that. And now that director of labor and employment is looking for a junior labor and employment lawyer. So we've reached the point, I think, in the industry where legal departments are able to look for um, intern. First of all, they're, they're able to offer legal internships, which is something we didn't see a lot of um, when I was first coming into the industry. Um, and they're hiring a, a more diverse, from an experience perspective, a more diverse set of, of candidates, everyone from you know, new grads um, to, to people with 10 years of experience. So I think there are a lot more opportunities out there um, but it doesn't change the fact that the the basic legal skills, they're going to look for strength in writing, strength in negotiating, strength in contract writing. Um, th those things are going to be a, a certainty no matter what, <laughs> no matter where you go or or how how old or young you are. Um, and the the experience, even if it's if it's summer programs or internships, those are gonna those are gonna speak. Um, speak volumes because you have those contacts that can advocate for you when you're when you're out looking for for roles. Well, Audrey, I just want to say thank you again for joining us for today's yeah. intern orientation, for staying yeah. over time with us, um, for giving us the benefit of your experience. And um, you know, again, we 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 pushed it on on social media, um, and we we think that we're accurate, but you know, it's great to celebrate. <laughs> My the first father, space lawyer the in lawyer, space. My father, the lawyer, thinks that you're accurate too. So okay, you, excellent. You've got, his, <laughs> you've got his book. Thank you so much, Nathan. I, I appreciate you inviting me. I, I really do. I love talking to you guys. So thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Audrey. And good luck, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.
And thank you to all the attendees who uh, have uh, been here with us for this intern orientation. Thank you to everybody watching the recording of this on YouTube. Um, again, please like and subscribe if you are watching this on YouTube. And if you uh, want to see more videos, including our previous intern orientation from 2020, which included panels on government careers in space law and commercial careers in space law, please check that out youtube.com forward slash Space Court Foundation. Uh, I hope everybody has a great weekend and we look forward to working with you and hearing from you. Bye-bye.